Can't cheat the mountain, Pilgrim. Be Wise and Survive is a public outreach program we use to help keep folks safe while recreating in the mountains. Be Wise and Survive not only applies to recreationists, though. The same principles apply to us in search and rescue. Hello, I'm Dwight Johnson, Sergeant for the Search and Rescue Unit for the Umatilla County Sheriff's Office in Pendleton, Oregon. In this video, we want to familiarize searchers with the safety protocols that should be incorporated into search and rescue operations all the time, every time. You know, every organization has a culture. In the past, some organizations developed a culture that prioritized production over personnel safety. This became true in the wildland fire agencies immediately following World War II. As a result, these agencies suffered several significant fatalities that caused them to rethink their programs and priorities and to change their culture. They learned that having a can-do attitude does not benefit the mission when accompanied by personnel accidents. When looking at the culture of your organization, is it dictated from the top down? Is it just a reliance on common sense? Are safety mitigations a reaction to events? Are you not letting risk get in the way of the mission? Then you have an old-style traditional view of safety similar to those held by wildland fire agencies of the past. A risk management approach is characterized by a methodical system where safety is an integral part of the operation. It is proactive and involves all personnel. We in Search and Rescue need to ensure that we embrace the risk management culture. It starts with an acceptance that safety is not for wimps. It's not just common sense, not just something the command worries about, and is not just a motherhood and apple pie word. Safety should be a way of thinking throughout all levels of the organization. It should be a critical component incorporated into all our strategies and tactics. It should be our culture. Safety success on a SAR operation means that everyone gets home uninjured, ready and able to respond to the next call out. The welfare of our searchers is our number one priority. Not only do search commanders care about their personnel, but it also compromises whatever mission we are undertaking when a searcher is injured. So our number one incident objective on any search mission should always be to ensure as best we can the safety of every searcher. This should be incorporated into any ICS 202 incident objectives that your management team creates. We know what we do is inherently risky. We can't eliminate risk but we can use risk management principles to help us make proper decisions when accepting such risk. It is obvious that this gentleman, intent upon his beach outing, did not use proper risk assessment techniques. Luckily for us, we have a pretty good risk analysis process that has been developed for SAR. We call it SARGAR, an acronym that stands for Search and Rescue, Green, Amber, or Red. SARGAR is a six-step systematic process used to analyze a task, assignment, or situation to determine the safest way to proceed. The process can and should be used at any stage in the incident. It is designed to be used at the team level. The two times it should always be used is at the time an assignment is received and whenever during that assignment an event occurs or the situation changes, resulting in new or increased safety concerns. The SARGAR system uses the acronym SAFETY to help ensure that all elements of an assignment or operation are considered for their safety implications. The acronym stands for Supervision, Assignment, Fitness of the Team, Environment, Team, and Improvisation. The first step in this process is to identify potential hazards associated with each SARGAR element. Let's look at those elements. S is for supervision. Is the chain of command clear to everyone? Does everyone know who their direct supervisor is? Does everyone know the chain of command above their direct supervisor? A is for assignment. Are the assigned tasks clear to everyone on the team? Does everyone understand their role? Has enough time been given to complete the assignment? 
what level of precision is needed? F is for fitness of the team. Are all team members physically able to perform their assigned tasks? Are all members rested? Is anyone on the team ill? E is for environment. What are the environmental hazards likely to be encountered during the assignment? This element often requires the most analysis since SAR operations often occur in challenging environments. When assessing the search environment, it is helpful to use one method taught to wildland firefighters. Look up, look down, look all around. This is also called establishing situational awareness. T is for team composition. Does the team have the necessary skills, training, and experience to complete the assignment? Is the team sized and equipped appropriately? Can the team operate cohesively? Are there any personnel conflicts that need to be resolved? I is for improvisation. Are our tactics among those commonly used for such situations, or are we having to invent on the fly? If we are improvising, we have to carefully consider the safety of our improvisation. Has it been carefully considered? Are there alternatives? A quick note, some agencies reverse the meaning of the F and the T in the acronym. It doesn't matter which system is used as long as everyone is on the same page and all hazard elements are considered. The next step in the SARGAR process is to assess the risk for each element. Risks are categor categorized in one of three levels, green, amber, or red, the GAR of SARGAR. Green risks are good to go risks. Nothing needs to be done, the risk is acceptable, or there are no significant risks, and the team can proceed. Amber risks are those where there is a concern and the risk needs to be discussed in more depth and mitigation measures might be considered. Uh, the team can proceed once this process is completed at the discretion of the team. Red is a risk that appears unacceptable as presented and is a no-go unless acceptable mitigations can be devised. If the team thinks the risk can be mitigated, the team should consult the chain of command before proceeding. This matrix is a system used in aviation and other disciplines to help with risk assessment. It is color-coded similarly to the GAR system to reflect measurement of the risk. Events are categorized by their probability, that is, how likely are they to occur, and their consequences, that is, how significant will the consequences be if the event does occur, both to the team members and to the mission, that is, the incident objectives. With each amber or red, risk versus gain needs to be identified next, because many risks can be mitigated but not eliminated. Whether to accept the risk depends upon the effectiveness of the mitigation and the expected gain. Gain is normally measured in terms of victim life-saving or injury prevention. It makes no sense to accept a risk when the gain is inconsequential to the incident objectives. The next step is to consider mitigations. Are there any risk control options available? Each incident will invariably present unique hazards that may or may not have mitigation options. Other hazards are common to many incidents and risk control tactics have already been devised. Mitigations for supervision concerns might involve decreasing span of control by breaking one team into two or adding strike teams or divisions into an incident. It might mean designate a different team leader who is more familiar with a particular skill or tactic. Assignment complexity mitigations might include requesting a delay in deployment to provide more time for analysis and detail identification. Assignment modifications might be made or the time allotted for completion increased. Team fitness might be mitigated by reassigning personnel or providing for some rest time prior to deployment. Environmental mitigations are as varied as the hazards. They might include placing a rope line for footing, requiring trekking poles, using specialized PPE, posting lookouts, and delaying or otherwise changing the deployment time. Team composition might be mitigated by bringing in additional team members or providing specialized equipment such as PFDs or rescue harnesses. And are you improvising? If so, sit down, take a pause, and re-examine your tactic. Is it sound? Are there safer alternatives? 
Once the mitigations are identified, the next step is the execution decision. Is it go or no go? Are the risks still a red or have they been mitigated to a green or amber and is the risk worth the gain? If a risk is still considered a red but the team feels the risk has been mitigated and or that the gain is worth the risk and the team recommendation is to execute, the team leader should consult with chain of command before doing that execution. If the decision is to execute, to go, the final step is to monitor. Safety is a continual process, and if conditions change or mitigations do not seem to be working, it is time to reevaluate. The best way to conduct a SARGAR is for the team leader or an experienced team member to go through the elements using a SARGAR card. Everyone circles up and weighs in individually with their assessment of the hazard and any mitigation strategies. The SARGAR facilitator should ask for assessments from each member of the team, starting with the most inexperienced personnel and going to the most experienced. This helps ensure that the actual concerns of inexperienced team members get voiced. Inexperienced members might not bring up a concern if not brought up by more experienced searchers. Ironically, it is not unusual for inexperienced personnel to see things that experienced personnel do not. The familiarity breeds contempt idea. When conducting a SARGAR, it is best to use a SARGAR card to ensure that none of the elements are missed. There are a variety of these cards available. Each team member should carry a card and follow along with their own card during the process. This way, each searcher reviews the elements and SARGAR process and can double check that nothing has been missed. The best time to conduct an assignment time SARGAR is after the operational briefing. Many team leaders prefer to conduct the SARGAR at the deployment site so that the search environment can be assessed firsthand. There are some basic principles that are always incorporated into the SARGAR process. Do not accept risks that you do not believe have been adequately mitigated and for which the gain is worth the risk. Make sure to mitigate ambers and reds. Any unmitigated risk should be accepted by all team members before executing. Red risks should be executed only with permission from the chain of command. Team members must understand that everyone is a safety officer, from the least to the most experienced team member, from the highest to the lowest in the chain of command. All have the ability and the duty to call a halt to search operations when a safety issue is perceived. Any team member can and should call for a SARGAR if they perceive conditions have changed and team safety is compromised. Another important principle, if a single team member categorizes a hazard as red, it's a team red. Any amber and red risks should normally be mitigated if a team is to execute. Let's talk briefly about environmental hazards. First, each season presents its own set of hazards. In the summer, heat exhaustion, stroke, dehydration, steep terrain, loose rocks and grass, windfalls, rain, snags, lightning, wind events, animals, rattlesnakes, bee stings are all common hazards encountered by searchers. Can you think of any others in your area? In winter, hazards change significantly and many require altogether different mitigations hypothermia, frostbite, tree wells, avalanches, slippery roads, and rotten spring snow are some of the common hazards encountered. Can you think of others? There are several special situations that we will briefly touch on that present significant hazards to search operations. In the winter, avalanches can be of considerable concern in the mountains of Oregon. Avalanche safety and avalanche rescue are complex complex specialized topics that require many hours of training. To touch on the major points, avalanches can present extreme hazards to searchers whether on foot or snow machines. The most dangerous slopes are normally between 30 and 60 degrees. Weak layers are caused by snow settling, crusting, or snow crystal degrading into particles sometimes referred to as corn. New snow on top of these layers can be prone to sliding. In addition, snow loaded on a slope by wind and the lack of anchors beneath and in the snowpack, such as in tight canopied forests, 
and large boulders increase the risk of avalanches. Searchers who expect to work in avalanche prone areas should seek additional training on this topic. Another special situation that searchers may encounter is working near water. Floods are a common incident requiring SAR response that results in SAR personnel being exposed to water hazards. Moving water is of special concern. PFDs must be worn during flood response working within close proximity of moving water. Swiftly moving water can be dangerous even at shallow depths and can carry a searcher into deeper water filled with hazards. When wearing PFDs, make sure to use the correct size and that the fasteners are correctly secured per manufacturer's specifications. If moving water must be crossed, such as a creek, searchers should loosen their packs so they can be readily jettisoned. Searchers are encouraged to seek out the Marine Enforcement or Swift Water Rescue Units for more training in water safety. Fatigue is a killer. Fatigue is a factor only recently recognized as highly significant. Wildland firefighting agencies now have strict work rest guidelines in place due to this factor. For SAR, fatigue is a huge problem. The number one injury accident associated with SAR incidents is the motor vehicle accident. Most NVAs on SAR incidents are caused by fatigue. Studies have shown that fatigue drivers can be just as impaired as intoxicated drivers. Always make sure that the driver is rested and able to drive safely. Consider using designated drivers or simply delay the drive home. There are many special situations that searchers might encounter. Many are unique to the areas in which the search occurs. Forest fires, poachers, drug production, camps of wanted persons, animals, tornadoes are just a few. The key to remaining safe and uninjured is to identify these hazards in advance and make methodical decisions regarding risk as this video has outlined. We will end our presentation by discussing the worst case scenario, an injured searcher. The safety of our searchers is always our number one priority. When an accident does occur during an assignment, the team leader should stop the team and immediately report to the chain of command after providing any needed immediate first aid. This is deemed an incident within an incident, and the injury of the searcher will normally be considered a priority with incident personnel diverted to the scene as directed by operations. We sincerely hope this never happens during your SAR career. By practicing the techniques described in this video, such cases should be few and far between. So let's conclude by asking again, what is your safety culture? I sincerely hope this training has helped you to become more aware of how important safety is and how important it is to have safety embedded into your organizational culture. I hope you found this video presentation informative and are leaving with some tools that will help keep you safer during search and rescue incidents. Thank you for being part of your local search and rescue organization. This is Sergeant Johnson wishing you effective and safe search and rescue operations.